Well, we can get started. Welcome everyone to this nice, crisp fall day. Um, hope you guys are all doing well. So as we were talking, we don't have a quorum yet. So I think we're going to go through the agenda and then we can look at the end of the meeting and see who we have. Um, so we will officially approve the agenda and the minutes at the end, unless you see anyone else pop up. Don't think so. Okay. Um, no public comments today. So we're going to just move into section five. Um, we have what we've been doing lately for those who are new. Um, we've been talking about um, going around the room, introducing yourself and sharing trainings that's going on, information sharing, anything that's coming up. But if I caveat that first, we want to celebrate the um, CASTA award winners. And I have the JPEG on my computer. I can read it off. Um, I don't, unless you want me to share my screen, but we want to celebrate you guys that were at the conference that got some awards. And then when it comes to your turn, um, feel free to go ahead and tell us a little bit more about the award or anything that you want to share about that. So, um, and I can just go down the list, even if it's not some of the folks on the MCC, it's the community or, you know, across the state of Colorado, but um, the best written comment went to RTD. And then, um, yay, for Human Services Agency of the Year, went to Teller Senior Coalition, so congratulations. Um, Marketing Program of the Year went to Clear Creek County Transit. And then Outstanding Coordination Initiative of the Year, <clears throat> excuse me, went to Town of Breckenridge, um, a partnership with an after-school program. And then the Best Resort Agency of the Year went to City of Aspen. And then this one's exciting. The Small Community Transit Agency of the Year went to Cripple Creek Transit. Very Ooh. cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then Transit Project of the Year went to Mountain Metro Transit. So maybe they want to tell us what project that was. I'm naive, so I might <clears throat> have no idea. Um, so congratulations to them. Um, Transit Professional Newcomer of the Year went to Charity Marcus from Set Setran. So I'm not sure where that's from. Um, and then Transit Champion of the Year, congratulations to Gail Nails of Invita. So that's really exciting. That's a big deal. And then the last one is Transit Champion of the Year. Um, they must have two of those. Um, went to Sarah Hill in Durango. So congratulations. Um, and we want to acknowledge that. And uh, we can always send that out maybe via email too if people want to see the screen of that. Um, but yeah, as, as we go around the room, feel free to talk more about that um, or your experience at CASTA as well. So why don't we go? I'm Kristen with Goodwill. I really have no updates or anything. Um, so I'm just going to go down the list. So we have um, Rocky Mountain Healthcare Services. So welcome. If you want to say your name, I don't know if that's Stacy on the call or um, a different person, but feel free to introduce yourself and, and your role. And you are, <clears throat> excuse me, you are muted. And I can come back to you too. Yeah, Kristen, this is Stacy with the Rocky Mountain Pace. I'm awesome. The, um, Director of Transportation. I oversee all the transportation along with all our um, outside scheduling. So I didn't, I didn't go to Costa though. Um, okay. <clears throat> well, we're glad to have you here. We're really glad. Um, feel free to ask any questions. We're you know, there's a lot of changes coming to the MCC maybe um, in the next few months, kind of blowing it up. So we're really glad to have you here. Thank you. Okay. And then next, I'm so sorry, I can't see you very well, but I just see iPhone. <laughs> so my apologies. I think that's me. <laughs> it is Deanna you. Rumsey. Oh, I'm sorry, Deanna, I couldn't see you very Don't well. Don't worry about it. I'll get closer. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so uh, things are going well. We're uh, gearing up to do some voting pieces because uh, the Independent Center is a VSPC. Um, so we'll be offering all accessible voting for those folks who want to come in and vote in person instead of putting their ballot in the mail or in a drop box. Um, and then the Transportation uh, Transit uh, Passenger Advisory Committee is also going really well. Um, we're going to be um, finishing up uh, revamping the bylaws and then we will open it up to the public in February. So we're super excited to kind of get that up and going and moving down the, the road, so to speak. Thank you, Deanna. That's a really cool thing, mm -hmm. voting and stuff going on. It's a big deal. Um, and then next I have Gail 
And then you want to introduce, I can't also see in the room too, if you want to introduce who you have in the room with you, Gail. So yeah, good morning. It's Gail Nels with Invita, and I'm in the room with Alex, our IT specialist that's helping support Invita and all the things we're working on. Um, yeah, glad to be here and I'll be presenting later. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, and Alex. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. IT is very important. So thank you very much. I'm glad to have you guys here. And then we have Allison. Congratulations on your award, Allison, <laughs> from Mountain Metro. Hello. Thank you. I am Allison Burns. I'm the ADA coordinator with Mountain Metro. Jacob Matson will be hopping on. Um, he said about 10 because he's going to be going over the uh, free fair, September, August uh, data that he was gonna share. So yes, exciting. Our award at Casta was for our uh, the downtown shuttle um, and we couldn't be more proud. Um, it's a super cool, super cool little bus that goes around. It's marked free everywhere, but it goes from the Robson Arena um, down to Widener Field and just sort of makes loops. You can catch it about every seven minutes uh, downtown. So it's a cool service and it's wow. free, so idea that's so yes. cool very cool thank you um okay it kind of jumped around on me um so now i have paul with the independent center i really don't have any updates but my name is paul and i work with the independent center i'm the assistive technology specialist awesome thanks paul yep um and then diana van auken Congratulations on your award. Good morning, thank you. Yeah, we're very, very proud of our team up here. Um, we're doing a wonderful job with providing transportation throughout Teller County. And of course we do um, Eastern Park County and Western El Paso County for transportation. So we are um, in the process of adding additional routes. Um, we are also gonna be providing transportation for Deckers, which is in Southern Douglas County. Um, another area that's really um, underserved with, with, for transportation. And um, we're just excited to be doing everything we're doing. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, next, Chelsea. Hey everybody, Chelsea Gondek, Director of Planning Mobility for the Downtown Partnership. I have what I'm hoping is just a cold, so I'll be brief. Um, we are super excited about the downtown shuttle um, that was mentioned previously and can't wait to hear about the Fair Free August and how that went. Uh, no specific project updates from us right now. Awesome, thank you so much. Hopefully you do just have a cold and you get better soon. Um, and then I have Kathy next. So I'm Kathy Lowry, Executive Director of the Teller Senior Coalition, and I'm just listening in to see what's going on. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Did I miss anyone? I'm going to come back to Laura in the conference room <laughs> and all of you guys. Um, take it away. So Melissa. With Melissa, the sorry. Area, yeah. you know, the Pikes Peak Area Agency on Aging. And um, sitting, you can't see his face until he leans in, but I'd like to introduce uh, Jared and have Jared mention who, what he's doing for us. Good morning, everyone. Public Information Officer for uh, TPACG. Awesome. And what that means is he oh, is, <laughs> he is the communicator to the public about things that are going on at PPACG, but also for our partners too. So feel free to reach out to, I think um, Melissa's gonna put his email in the chat. Wink, wink. Um, <laughs> uh, put his email in the chat. If you guys have anything that um, is going on within your organization that we could help push um, information um, out about, um, that would be great to send to him. So. Um, like the the Park County um, the Park County Transit Study Survey was a great example of an opportunity for us to help support and uh, push information out to our jurisdictions as well as to um, the public that's 
uh, connected to PPACG. So anything that we can help support you guys on, he is here um, for that. So cool. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Thanks, guys. My updates are um, I'm going to talk a little bit later on, um, but I do want to give kind of a, an update. Um, we uh, ran from MMT and I attended the, um, and I think actually did too, um, Allison. I attended the um, city council meeting yesterday, which was the workshop. Um, it was talking, we were bringing up the uh, changes to the IGA for um, our partnership with MMT uh, for funding. Um, and so that conversation went really great with the, with the um, council members. Um, basically, we made a few um, changes to the IGA that kind of uh, helped support the reality of the program around NTD reporting. Originally, there was the thought that PBACG could be the super reporter for NTD for our providers. Um, NTD does not allow us to do that. So it is on the providers to, to do that NTD reporting for us. So we had to change some of the language in the IGA um, to reflect sort of PBACG's role in supporting providers through um, the reporting process with NTD. So, um that that like I said, that went great and there was no questions from any of the um council members. There was just a kudos from Yolanda Avila um uh, about the change and, and how um NMT and PPACG and the providers are really supporting each other through um the transition the past couple of years. So um thanks again for you can take back uh Allison. Uh, thanks again for LAN and actually support um, in getting those changes made. So we also are going to be able to access uh, an additional um, amount of funding through our relationship with MMT. Uh, this was something that was a part of the original um, uh, LOI with MMT when we uh, made the transition for from the 5310 program coming to PPACG. And so there's additional funding coming to us um, that's really tied to that NTD reporting moving forward. So um, it's, it's great that we're bringing more money into the community so that we can help um, serve those. NTD reporting is actually tied to funding through FTA. So um, as rides and um, what's revenue miles are turned in through uh, NTD, we actually get funding and credit for those rides. So it's important that we continue to, to, um, to, to bring in as much as possible through that. So that's my main update. It's sort of outside of what we're going to talk about later on today. Any questions on that? I couldn't really hear a lot of it, but I, I'll chat with Laura at another time. It doesn't work. That so, little thing is not working. She tried to plug it in. So we're work. just talking through the computer? I guess so. Fine. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it does sound like you guys are farther away. Um, I can hear you, but it, it's a little bit harder to hear. Do you want to mute? I heard Melissa better than Laura. <laughs> so... Um, projecting. Um, and I think we had one more sneak in. Um, Jason, we were going around the room and just saying any updates from our agency. Did you want to say anything? No, not at this point. <laughs> Thank okay. you. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Well, we might. Do we have um, a quorum now, Melissa? We do. Okay, would you guys rather vote now in case people have to leave early? Yes. Okay, um, if you don't mind, I'm trying to just pop on. So we're gonna go ahead and um, approve the agenda and then the minutes from August and September. Um, so do I have a motion to approve the agenda for today? I move to approve. 
And that was Deanna? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Diana Van Auken, I'll second that. Okay, thank you. Any opposed? Okay, um, and then we're proving the minutes from August and September. Hopefully you guys all had a chance to look at that. Um, September's was pretty brief meeting. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from August and September? Don't all go at once. <laughs> this Diana, I'll move to approve the minutes for August and September. Thank you. Is there a second? I second that. <laughs> Thank you guys. I'll second it. Always can count there you it. Go. Just as long as I don't mix up your names back and forth. So we've got, yeah, Diana motion to approve that. Deanna seconded. So thank you guys. Um, You're welcome. And then, so anything else from Melissa or Laura? Otherwise, we'll move forward with our presentations. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll move, we'll have Jacob later um, since he might pop on after 10 o'clock. Um, so we'll go to Envita. We're super glad that Gail and Al Alex, right? Hopefully I didn't mute that up, are here today. Um, Gail, congratulations on your award. That's a pretty amazing award to be champion of the year. So congratulations on that. I don't know if you guys have slides or anything. Otherwise, we just wanted to see what's going on with you guys and changes that have been happening with you. So take it away. So yes, we do have uh, some slides presented and um we are flattered, um, although it's transit uh, champion. Um, I think we all know it's never done just by one person. So I really want to thank my team. Um, people that normally would be presenting today, uh, uh, Eric and Lawrence, um, they are busy. And so it's my turn in the whole to present. Um, but Eric is doing, I think, a, um, a radio interview at this time. So you guys are able to see the screen OK? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, um, and, and you can tell we have a, a an IT person because our slides are pretty awesome now. So thank you, Alex. <laughs> Next slide, please. So um, most of you know our mission. Uh, we've been around for over 50 years in the community. You know, first as an AMBA cab as a program under um, kind of the Pikes Peak Health Association and later Pikes Peak Partnership. But so we started first as just, um, you know, transporting people um, in a van donated by the Rotary Club for people with disabilities. And then we went on, you know, to support the community in the city when the ADA passed and we supported the um, uh, expansion, I guess, of Metro Mobility into the city of Colorado Springs. And so here we are today still doing the same mission of helping people um, get to where they need to go to be independent, but we've expanded that to not just people with um, disabilities or physical disabilities, it's much more broadly uh, defined uh, demographic that we serve as well as geographic. So I just wanna, you know, when uh, we changed our name from AMBACAP to Invita, which means together in life, we wanted to have a more positive view and not a diminished view of, you know, who we serve and so, we want to make sure that we are respectful of all people. I'm not sure whose computer is still on with the noise, but um, so we just like they were resourceful. We tried to solve these problems and we're dependable. What we found was we came to transportation that was the most, the, the attribute most uh, needed and respected um, from, the, from the people we serve. And the resiliency, I think we all had to define what that meant uh, during COVID um, and how we were to serve the community I know most of you knew that we participated in the um, COVID uh, transportation for the homeless communities um, when we had the city isolation center and then the city of Hope uh, there on North Nevada. And we're now working with um, uh, Springs Rescue Mission to also look at the Shigella, uh, if there's gonna be an outbreak working with that. And so how we work with that and respond to the community is, is what we do. So that's that innovation. And, and I think we all can say, you know, when we hire our drivers, it is around that they're compassionate people um, and they uh, listen to the needs of our community. 
And so we do, you know, the transportation, the door through door, ADA, and the Pikes Peak area. Um, we also do the uh, rural um, kind of more deviated fixed route on the eastern El Paso County um, from Callahan in and connecting to the um, Mountain Metro, um, I guess, station up there on Voyager. We also work with uh, Rush and Ellicott out there working with um, a community of a, a veterans living center out there um, and connecting in. What we found is the Walmart is a hub of all things in our rural El Paso County. So we work a lot on that. And we look at how to you know, braid all these funds to support uh, the communities that we serve. And then we also do home care. I'm sure most of you are aware of that as well. Um, looking at, um, it's not home health, it's home care. So it's those activities of daily living, it's personal care, homemaker, maintenance. And we're also doing some private pay at this point. And we serve uh, seven counties in the home care and uh, more three and more of the transportation. And so here we are. And uh, it's a big state. <laughs> yep. And so uh, we have our drivers and um, this is all the Invita drivers from a while ago. We get to uh, bring them all in again for a more recent photo, but now we employ over 50 drivers and um, I can tell you that's a very interesting uh, challenge to go from more like a 20 to 25 drivers to 50 drivers. Uh, how we onboard and train and support the drivers um, continues to help us innovate. And so um, we'll be updating this picture hopefully soon, um, but that, that's who we are. Um, let's go to the fleet. So um, now with, um, the acquisition of coach, we have like 50 vehicles from, you know, the SUVs um, all the way to the body on chassis vehicles. And we you know, work hard to maintain them within budgets that are um, important to look at um, and where we house them. I, um, we are bringing them from um, the coach vehicles that were located down on Pikes Peak in Union here to our, um, our offices here of our, on Academy and uh, Vickers. And so, yes, we did acquire a coach back um, the end of um, March. So we were like, oh, basically. darn. <laughs> and I... then we are um, looking at, um, so six months in, what does that look like? Um, it was, um, as all things new, oh, well, it's harder than it sounded. And um, so as we integrate, um, there are basically two different service delivery models around uh, transportation. And so I don't know if you many of you knew uh, Chris Dell, um, but he got out of the, um, the transportation business and uh, we stepped up and said, let's see what we can do together. And so, you know, it's, you know we, there's a, Main focus on um, medical appointments and the day programs with intellectual and development disabled community. Um, we are considered a PASA, that's a provider uh, support organization. So of course we're working with TRE. Um, and we you know, look at more of those social determinants of health to see what we can do. And um, we are moving towards um, more and more of an on-demand model. Um, we think that is, that is kind of what happened at, uh, during COVID when you know, we had one person on a bus that was allowed at a time. And so people got used to um, uh, being able to get a ride when they wanted one. And that uh, today is being challenged as more and more people want to resume the lives that they did lead and to go to more activities. So we're working at blending the demand response and the on-demand. And of course that DB fixed route. And so here we are answering the phones. Um, and uh, many, many of you might um, have some empathy is that, uh, but you know, we have people on the phones, but uh, what we've noticed is there's a, still some call offs on our dispatch and scheduling. And so that confounds us in, in trying to meet, you know, target goals around um, the response times to people calling in and how long they wait for us to answer and how long it takes for us to get back to uh, those voicemails that are left, uh, voice messages. But um, so we're working on that uh, demand response. 
and go back to work. And so we, you know, a, a lot of the coach model was much more on demand where they were doing, you know, some hospital discharges. They were working with uh, um, the assisted living centers um, to transport people. And so we're looking at um, how to blend these two really distinct service delivery models with different expectations of the clients and the providers, you know, the, the healthcare facilities that we're working with, their expectations um, around that versus what was a more traditional uh, human service transportation model as well as a fixed transportation model. So that um, integrating these two, um, actually we have two different software programs we, we work with. Um, we're trying to work on how to integrate that uh, within ourselves um, when it comes to um, uh, reporting and what that might look like for NTD. Um, and then also, um, how we share um, uh, who's, who takes a ride if there's overflow. So part of this, I mean, one of the reasons we, we bought Coach was as a community investment to provide more vehicles on the road to, um, act, to support our community. Um, what that means is uh, because we have more vehicles on the road and more drivers, we are consuming our uh, funding faster than anticipated in anyone's budgets. Um, but, but yet we're still denying rides. Uh, we shared some of those rides, I know, with uh, Silver Key of late, um, as we're trying to keep the number of denials down, but um, and still support our community. But it's been a challenge um, from the two software systems, and we'll look at uh, in the future how we plan to integrate those um, basically software programs and different service delivery models. And so most of you know our fixed route bus schedule um, all the way from Calian uh, to Payton. And we're seeing that we now have um, the Falcon route is almost like a circulator there because there's people going from Callahan into Falcon for work. And then they come back in and do the Metro Transit Hub they run Voyager. And then the um, bus route out to Ellicott and, um, and rush into um, uh, bigger uh, the medical facilities um, down there. But once again, it seems like Walmart is where everyone wants to go. Right. So these are some of our community uh, partners that we work with um, around um, from the PASA, the Intellectual and Development uh, Disabled Group. Um, as well as um, you know, some of the hospital systems we work with, and of course, paid systems. So here's like some of the number of rides, and you can see the uh, growth we experienced from January to uh, um, and uh, looking at um, current ride volumes, and so. Um, and so, Laura, this is why we're talking about, yeah, I, I think we're going to need some more help around funding um, about that. And then, um, next slide. But as I said, we, were, we do track the denials. I mean, that's how we feel like we're best serving the community. And so you can see um, we're working on uh, the, the denials, but we're also seeing you know, some of the no shows are increasing, I guess, as a percentage of um, the number of rides. Oh, no, it's not, these are absolute values. And then, you know, the cancels. And so, how we look to manage that um, is, you know, on the transit department and our dispatchers. I think we do a pretty good job, um, but we're looking for how we can share more of these rides to avoid so many denials. I mean, it's really from, I, I think, in, in Laura, this is around the PPACG contract, you know, tracking, you know, the number of denials is important because it does express, you know, what the demand is and uh, the funds needed to support um, community needs. And so, you know, it's kind of always interesting, you know, where we get a lot of our funding, but, you know, it's kind of a nice pie split. I think it shows the types of rides we're doing too. And so that's it. Thanks so much. Yeah.
Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That's really, really good data and um, an awesome acquisition and merger that you guys did and serving the community. Does anyone have um, questions? Comments? I have a question uh, about the MOD um, mobility on demand with you guys. Um, is that accessible as well? Hi, Paul. How are you? Yes, uh, we're we are working on that, and yes, most of our vehicles are accessible. Um, and then you know we are working with Laura with that uh, NADTC grant is that on demand pilot. And so we'll be looking at how we plan to roll that out. And so, Paul, I look forward to you being part of that pilot group that we serve. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? So this is Melissa um, in the conference room over here somewhere. Um, Gail, so right now, um, you don't have any mobility on demand rides happening yet, right? Because you're just in the process of trying to plan it, figure it out. Um, and so you don't have that yet, right? No, I'm not, I, can't, I, I wouldn't say that because we do have a lot of that on demand from the coach system. So it's not particularly integrated. And so when we do receive a call or that same day or within that 24 hours, you know, if we will push that uh, request over to, we'll first look at the Invita fleet, and then we go over to the coach fleet to see if we can put a ride on that. But, I mean, what we're looking at is a more cohesive uh, uh, rollout and what that means from, um, like, a more social determinants of health uh, view. But it's, it's kind of, um, it's not sophisticated it's band-aid together unless it's not a real cohesive it's just i think um it speaks to one of our values is just we're being resourceful and innovative about how we can you know meet people's requests where they are now but i think um the uh, opportunity that grant will help us to be more thoughtful and integrative with that approach and capture all this data so we can report out what does that look like and there are additional costs to an on-demand model um, it requires a lot more phone uh, interaction with people um, and monitoring that and making sure people are picked up when they ask for those rides. Thanks for that, Gail. I, I was kind of thinking that you're kind of doing a little bit of a modified approach, so thank you. Hey, Gail. Um, I have another question about that on demand. How does that, like, if I was to call, do I tell the scheduler that I'm looking for the on-demand on demand ride, or do I just say I need a ride like today at, you know, three o'clock, for instance, or how's that, how's that go about? So, Paul, thank you. Uh, so, right now, what that looks like, and, and let me be very uh, transparent here, um, you know, we, we keep, uh, we're training our dispatchers so that they um, remove themselves from this uh, script that they learned about scheduling to now be more responsive on the on demand. So, um, and I think that will be part of that grant is that we will have to be retraining the dispatchers about the phone skills and the scripts that they use. But currently, I mean, we do, we do have that ability and we continually remind our dispatchers to say, let's see if I can fit you in today. And so that's what's going on. And Paul, I'm curious if you do call, let me know if that's not what's happening. But, you know, we are looking at training, but we've had, um, I think with this growth and the demand of the rides, um, we're still drinking from the fire hose. And so we address those issues as they come up. And I would appreciate your input in letting us know how we do. So thank you, Paul. One more. Awesome. Sorry. Sorry. And I will, Gail, me and Edgar, we would like to actually talk to you uh, on a, a different note. But um, for instance, like if our rides for some reason are not met, like our pickups to come to work um, and we get a hold of the scheduler or the dispatch person, um, can they or will they still be able to give us that on demand demand ride? So what we've seen is, um, yes, work is very important 
and we understand the, the necessity to make sure we deliver that ride. But I can say we are still experiencing driver call-offs due to illnesses. And so that really confounds our ability, especially when a lot of those work rides are the first rides of the morning before we can accommodate um, when someone calls off and we, you know, reshuffle the deck on how to um, meet all the ride requests that we've committed to for the day. And so that is, I, and I, I really don't see, I think we will be continue to be challenged in the fall and winter regarding that driver availability. I mean, right now, I think we're trying to overstaff in drivers so we can make that up. But um, you know, I think it's no secret, it's been well publicized that, you know, filling those driver positions is still very difficult. And uh, the kind of driver that uh, a human service transportation requires is a special kind of driver. And um, I can say we've let a few people go that don't fit. So I apologize if, you know, that is occurring to you, but we, I mean, I've had a couple of times five drivers call off at once. So if you're looking at, you know, over 20% of your driver force calling off, and it, it's going to be a problem. And um, I do track it, um, and I look at, you know, the call offs. And um, as I said, we are now looking at overstaffing the driver position so that we can mitigate um, other people getting sick and calling off. Thank you, Gail. Awesome, great questions. Um, anyone else have questions? Okay, well, thanks Gail and Alex for uh, pre presenting and those are great slides. You can come do mine anytime. <laughs> so thank you um, for presenting. And I think we have Jacob on the phone. Um, if he would like to do the update on the free fare at this time. So yeah, last uh, month uh, when I visited, I kind of gave you where we were at um, for August, but we didn't have uh, the numbers for September afterwards. So uh, just as a quick recap, um, we participated in the Zero Fare for Better Air campaign um, that was done through a uh, grant process with CASTA. Um, to offer free transportation um, on both of our fixed route and paratransit services for the uh, month of August. And uh, kind of as a recap of the last meeting, um, we did see um, really, really good uh, increases in, our, um, in the number of passengers that um, boarded our services. So I'm going to share my screen, assuming I can figure this out in relative easy fashion. You should be able to, Jacob. All right. Yeah, we use uh, Teams, so this is not as familiar to me. Where would it be at my um, options here? If you look down at the bottom where it has the mute and all that stuff, um, mm -hmm. you can. there's a button there that says share screen. I don't have that on mine. Um, exit full screen, which go up to the top in the middle. And... You should be able to press escape. <laughs> I did. It didn't do anything for me. You know what? It, it really, it, the slides, I don't really have much for slides um, anyway. So um, okay. they were just meant to give kind of a visual. So anyways, um, so yeah, we, uh, in the month of, so looking at our services, fixed route and paratransit, over in fixed route, we saw 302,883 uh, trips over on our fixed route services. And that was within about 2% of uh, pre-pandemic levels. So we really, really went up there um, in, in that arena. Um, from the previous month in July, it was 218,000 trips and some change. So to put that in perspective, um, we saw, um, oh, what does that come out to? I didn't actually call this number beforehand, but I could do it real fast. It was 36%, uh, no, 39%, 39%. Um, from July, but then we did decrease going into September. So we went from that 302,000 down to 213, back to kind of our normal levels. So historically, we do see a sort of um, small um, decrease between August and September in our fixed route services. It's right around five to 6% um, over the last five years. 
And paratransit sees a similar deal where it does go down. So we naturally see a little bit of a drop off, but obviously not as much as we saw it in September. So, you know, we're hoping to keep the, the, the riders around. And I don't know if those ask at this committee or at a different one about how, you know, what do we know about new driver? Or do we have information about new folks riding versus the original group? And unfortunately, we don't. Numbers kind of indicate it's probably our, our typical, uh, the, the normal passenger going, and people just increase their, their load throughout August. Um, over on Metro Mobility, our paratransit service saw a similar story where we increased um, from right around, uh, or not right around, right at 7,883 trips in July up to 10,666 in August. That was a 35% increase, um, but then we decreased down in September. Um, down to 10,058. And kind of like I commented, that is a normal thing we see um, from um, August to September in paratransit um, in terms of our ridership. So um, nice thing about this whole program we went through is we were able to get reimbursed for our lost fare revenue. So it was zero cost essentially to the city. Um, and our what we were um, looking to get reimbursed is $534,000. This uh, grant program, we're investigating whether or not we're going to do it next year. I think most of us here have a have a pretty um, positive feeling about how it went. That includes me. I was uh, very concerned about where what we could have seen with the increase in homeless population use and some of the issues that come with that with folks not getting up at the end of the line since we're not charging a fare, people just riding around um, all day. We have no reason to believe that really occurred outside of the normal. Um, it actually went pretty smooth. We had far less altercations as a result. So operationally, from my perspective, um, big success in, in that arena. So we're looking um, into doing this, potentially doing this next year. Um, there's been no specific word on it yet, but um, the, the, the grant program does allow for three months of free fare. Um, it's during the high ozone months of uh, June, July, and August. So um, we will be investigating whether or not to go for that in the upcoming year and probably getting a little bit more advanced notice this time around the grant really wasn't released until July um, for August. So by the time we could apply, get it out there and get the word out there, we were right at the doorstep of August. So if we do go down that route, hoping to get a little bit more advanced notice. So um, with that, um, any questions? Like I said, I gave some information on this last month. I don't know if anybody else has additional questions about this, but I'd be glad to uh, go over some of that. Those are great numbers, Jacob, and I know that Lan presented that to the um, council yesterday. So uh, kudos to you guys to taking that on. And, and yes, it was a very much so hurry up process. So um, it, from an operational perspective, I, I'm glad that you guys were able to rise to the occasion. So that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, ditto to what Laura said. That's really awesome and exciting that you might do it next year. Um, okay, I think next up is Laura and her updates. Take it away. Hold on just a second. I'm going to try to share my screen. This one, share. All right. So, um, you guys know that I've talked for the past, I don't know, nine months about, um, a transit needs assessment that we received funding through NADTC to, um, do in El Paso County. Um, we've actually been able to expand that into Park and Teller counties. Um, so we're working with their consultant team and um, with Teller Senior Coalition and other partners to kind of get the data that we um, need to sort of round out that assessment for our three county region. Um, but I want to talk through some of the results. We talked through, you know, slightly a couple of months ago what those preliminary results were. Um, I've completely sort of pulled together um, a report of, of everything. And I wanted to share with you guys the slides that I shared with our board of directors 
I think it's important for you guys to know what we're communicating to them. Um, they are our elected officials and those that can either be the best advocates for our program or the best question <laughs> questioners of our program. So, um, but I wanted to share what what are the, some of the common themes and needs and what I also presented to them as some of the challenges that you guys have expressed um, in addressing those needs. And um, after going through these slides, I want us to have just an open conversation about um, what are those challenges and what are some of those um, things that you guys have already been thinking about of how to address those challenges and what are the barriers to um, addressing those challenges. So going through this really quickly and, and then we'll get started on a, a conversation and I'll make sure I get us out of here um, uh, in a short time. So, um, these are the, the different methods that um, just as uh, as a planning organization, PPACG is involved in and in helping identify gaps, not just with transportation, but um, things like housing and, and um, transportation from surface road transportation and those types of things. So um, we are currently, I think Melissa has mentioned in the past that we are currently going through uh, the AAA four-year planning process. Um, I just realized you can't see me. Um, <laughs> we're going through the AAA four-year planning process. Um, and what that includes is community conversations in Park and Teller counties. And we are actually still working on our community conversations in um, El Paso County. Um, those questions that we ask seniors um, that are participating in those community conversations are centered around housing needs, um, social interaction needs, um, things like transportation and food and um, caregiver support, ombudsman, all of the programs that really fall within the AAA. Um, we're just sort of assessing um, the level of those specific needs in our communities. And so uh, I, uh, <laughs> I uh, have been working with our RAC chair, uh, B. Babbitt. Um, she has been facilitating a lot of these conversations. And um, the way that we've structured it is at the end of the conversations, we have them uh, rank their top needs. Um, and I had a conversation with B. Babbitt after going to um, the Fountain Valley Senior Center. Transportation is always number one or number two, um, primarily number one. And I said to her, why do I always win? <laughs> um, and it's not something that we, I, I wish that I was not winning on or, or our group is not winning on as, as a major need. So um, we... This helps inform PPACG and the AAA on what our investments are moving forward um, with our Older Americans Act funding, with the 5310 funding, PPRTA funding, um, and the Older Coloradans Act funding that we administer. So we want to know what the priorities are in the community um, and make for sure that we're pairing up that money um, with identifying providers um, to help with those needs as well as. Um, making for sure that we have the within our boundaries and within the amount of money that we can distribute um, our priorities right. So um, we also do the El Paso County Specialized Transit Needs Assessment. That is what we're doing and wrapping up right now. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're going to we are expanding this to Park and Teller counties. Um, the goal is to have a pretty concise report um, towards the end of November, early December from our consultant team um, that will really roll well into the specialized transit plan. Um, just to update on that, kind of a caveat on that, um, that plan has been uh, on hold. Um, we thought that it was going to kick off in the summer and then early fall, and now it's looking like it will kick off um, after the first of the year. Um, it, it was a little bit out of MMT and PPACG's control. Um, there needed to be some funds transferred 
amongst FTA to different accounts in order for us to, to do this. So we're looking at procurement um, at the end of this year, early next year, and then starting the plan, which will, um, those that participated last time, it was a very accelerated plan, but we've actually allocated about 12 months to complete the plan. So the, the needs assessment is going to help inform that process. Um, those of you who participated in the Tri-County study, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this was the first time that we've really, as PPACG, done a transportation assessment um, from a road perspective, from a, you know, broadband perspective, from um, a transit perspective in our three-county region. And um, it gave us a great um, insight into the specific needs that were um, highlighted within the, the original stakeholders through the Tri-County study, which were mostly elected officials. And transit um, ended up being the top, again, why do we always win? Um, the top need identified through those original stakeholder meetings. So that's why we had a transit focus group um, that really kind of dived into what are the gaps in services, but what are also sort of those regional connections that we need to make moving forward. Um, I know that uh, Teller Senior Coalition has already used the results um, from the, the Tri-County study to help leverage funding for some of their programs. I highly suggest those that are looking at um, funding opportunities that you take a look on our website at uh, the Tri-County study to um, note different or reference different things from the Tri-County study to help support your grant applications. Um, there was some great things that you guys could really piggyback on with your grant applications moving forward. It's also something great, CDOT helped, CDOT did fund this, uh, this study, this study, and they are well aware of the study. So um, if you're applying for funds through CDOT, it is in your best interest to reference the Tri-County study as you're proposing your projects. Um, and then the Park County Transit Study. This is something that we don't own. Invita is um, the project managers for the, the Park County Transit Study. Um, and I know that they are working hard um, with their consultant team just to identify the needs and potential um, uh, program offerings in the future. And um, I know that they have wrapped up their, um, their survey, um, which was really great. Um, and as of yesterday, I think Leslie from Invita uh, said that they have about 361 surveys from individuals in Park County um, to help support um, the assessment moving forward. So uh, great stuff going on and, and things that we're pulling from um, as, uh, as you know, planners ourselves and willing to pull from from other organizations that are doing um, great stuff like this. So I'm gonna move on, talked a lot about that. All right, for some reason, my this does not want to move forward. There it goes. Um, so these are, and talking to our board members, again, from that perspective, um, from our community conversations that we've been doing with the AAA, as well as the focus group meetings that we did here in El, Ca El Paso County, these are the sort of top things from a rural perspective that have been identified through those stakeholder conversations. And so, um, you know, Park County being so remote, um, their main concern is there's no, really no transportation in their area for essential services. Um, while there is busting um, that goes through 285, you can't make a um, a full day's trip of, of a busting ride there. Um, you, have, you would have to stay overnight in Denver um, because they don't come back until the next day. Um, also, there is some small transportation activities going through um, the uh, summit stage um, where they come to fair play, um, mostly to pick up workers that work at Breckenridge and the other ski resorts. And then lastly, um, as was mentioned earlier today, uh, Teller Senior Coalition is uh, doing some 
working on some routes in um, southern um, Park County that are, is just right over the line from Teller County, and and that's going to going to help uh, serve a great need that comes that is uh, uh, has been identified through um, stakeholder conversations for that part of the county. Um, from Teller's perspective, uh, this was the big. One that came out through conversations is there's no weekend or late night service. Um, uh, and operations of, of traditional fixed route is limited. And, and I wanted to express to our, um, our board members that we understand the limitations of our partners. Um, we understand the limitations of the providers that are, are, are trying to work to provide this service. And um, I wanted them to, to not look at this from a negative perspective, but from an opportunity perspective and, and um, also as a call to support you guys as you're trying to address these needs um, and let them know that you are trying to address these needs. Um, from El Paso, from the rural perspective, limited service due to service area boundaries of pro providers. Um, you have limitations on your operations of, of how far you can go with your vehicles um, from your facility. And it is a challenge for folks to navigate, you know, what provider actually can come to their house. You know, they're having to look at that from their ride perspective, not just origination of their ride, but also um, from the perspective of where they're where they need to go with that ride. And so it's very hard for them to, to navigate that from a ride, a, a, a destination perspective. Um, and there's, uh oh, what? sorry. Uh, my computer wants to restart. That's not great. <laughs> um, so we understand that there's capacity issues, but there are also just limitations based upon um, sort of you know, the constructs of your organizations, um, you know, city of Colorado Springs, it's the city of Colorado Springs. MMT is, is representing the city of Colorado Springs. Um, and so that's a core transit service um, for that area. Um, you know, we have Fountain Valley Senior Center that their core transit service is for the Southeast um, area of, of El Paso County. And then, you know, we have other providers. Silver Key is primarily focused on the core, you know, um, services of, of um, Colorado Springs, and they do go outside of those boundaries um, with limitations. You know, we all have our limitations, so that is a challenge for folks. Um, these were urban specific um, challenges that people express. Um, core transit system covers a limited service area of an expanding footprint of residential biz and business development. Um, this is something we want to continue to communicate to our board members um, because it, I know that everybody on the call really wants to, um, is driven um, a, by um, sort of a personal perspective of um, wanting to provide these services. I know that we're hearing from folks that we need this, we need this, we need this, but you don't always have the tools to provide it or the support to provide it. Um, so this, but this is an uh, overarching need that has been identified through this process is just the need for more core transit services. Um, it's also a conversation that sort of came up yesterday in the um, in the meeting with our county, our um, city council folks, when we were talking about water and water accessibility and the amount of water that we have available. Um, it's always back to we keep developing, but we don't have the resources and the, and the services available to those areas. It's like let's build a bunch of houses, but. <laughs> We, could, we don't really have um, the uh, support for the core services that um, are needed in those areas. Um, specialized transit providers have limited capacity and funding for providing services in areas that are not covered by core transit. Um, 
this is sort of that not having the right flavor of funding for the needs um, is the best way that I've described this is there's such limited um, transportation funding as our specialized transit providers on the call uh, know about. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to um, sort of peanut butter spread um, such limited resources in such a very, you know, challenging footprint, um, geographical footprint that we have to address um, needs within. Another challenge is hospital and essential services are being built up north and northeast. You know, um, it's something, there's a lack of core transit services in those areas, but also a lack of, um, you know, capacity for our specialized transit providers to make those trips. And um, several of the participants said that they're having to really think about where they live and where they work and also the doctors that they um, they visit because they may not have transportation or, or um, uh, dependable transportation for those types of um, trips. And then individuals have to choose, I mentioned this, where they live and work due to availability of transportation services. These are common core needs um, between the two. So if you're looking at it from the perspective and y'all seen where you have two circles and then they intersect with each other, these are the things that, that um, really intersect and resound in, in both rural and urban areas. So lack of core regional and transit services to connect people to essential services especially from a rural perspective, people just want to go places and they just don't have an option. <laughs> um, so it, that is one of the, the, the challenging things. And um, I know that we're trying to, as a group, address sort of um, the needs that are medical needs in particular. Um, it's hard enough to keep up with that, but, you know, the social interaction and social isolation piece is something that's also, you know, as Gail mentioned, so, um, um, is it social determinants of health? <laughs> um, it, it is one of those things that, that is kind of underlying that we miss. And so trying to make for sure that, again, flavor of funding, with AAA funding, we can't really provide for much recreational opportunities um, and things like that. So having the right funding sources to address all the needs that, of our ridership. And then people don't know uh, what services are available. And part of this is, is I'm going to continue, continually over the next 12 months as we step into our specialized transportation um, uh, planning exercise, we need to really figure this out. Um, I, from the perspective of a rider in trying to navigate what transportation provider is available or accessible or can or within their constraints um, provide a ride to a specific location, um, it's really difficult for them to navigate by themselves. So if, if they are, um, you know, calling a provider that is in the Southeast that only stays within their, the Southeast, but they need to go to, you know, the Northeast to a doctor's appointment, they're having to navigate through different providers to actually figure out who can give me that ride or who am I eligible, who am I, who am I eligible or how am, I don't know, what agency am I eligible for um, to provide that ride service? And a lot of times in these conversations, people felt like they can only be a Metro rider. They didn't know that they could also ride with Invita or Silver Key or Fountain Valley or with Goodwills. They just thought, okay, I'm owned by Metro. <laughs> so they felt like they that was their world. You know, everything had to be planned within the service area of that organization. And so we need to figure out how we can flip that, um, that concept um, and flip that culture that has been built within um, a lot of the riders um, so that they do understand that there's more options available to them. And then limited or no weekend service or late night services offered by providers. 
Um, I think about this from my my perspective of my own personal perspective of things that I just do after work um, that really, you know, increase my quality of life. Um, if I, if I couldn't go to a movie or if I couldn't go bowling in the evening or, you know, if I couldn't go see my friends, um, uh, on the weekend, if they had, you know, a birthday party or things like that, if I wasn't able to do that, then that's a huge deal. Um, that, that really boxes in somebody's life. Um, and so that's something that I also want us to talk about is, is what are our constraints and what are some of those levers that we can pull in the future as a collective um, to figure out how to address those needs to increase quality of life. And then people need access to on-demand trips. Life happens. Um, life happens. Uh, you may have a doctor call and say, hey, you know, I have an opening um, that has popped up and you had been waiting on that doctor's appointment for over a year. That happened to me trying to get to an OBGYN. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, you miss out on those opportunities that are, that are essential to us. Um, but also from the perspective that, you know, you may have a friend that calls and says, hey, you want to have dim dinner. And if you don't have any opportunities um, or, or services available to you for that last minute trip, that again is a box that you're building around yourself. So how do we overcome some of those issues? Oh, I wanted to communicate to our board these are the limitations that some of the limitations that we hear from from our providers. Like you guys are trying to do the best that you can. <laughs> and and we acknowledge that. And we need we understand that you guys need support moving forward in order to, you know, test different ways to help address these needs, but also have some relief from the pr pressure um, and knowing that both the AAA, the PPA, PPACG, our board, we're communicating these challenges so that, you know, they understand that if they get a call from one of their um, constituents saying, I have an issue with X provider, they have a, an answer for them of understanding, like, here's the barriers. Here's what, what may be a challenge um, that they're facing in providing that assistance. So. You know, uh, one of the biggest challenges that you guys face is understanding the, the resources and funding available and also those boundaries of those um, resources and funding um, streams. So, you know, within uh, just within El Paso County, we have parts of El Paso County that are covered by 5311 funds. And then we have parts of El Paso County that are covered by 5310 funds. Um, there's these just hardline boundaries of the funding that we we um, we access, and so it's really frustrating. I know from y'all's perspective on having to navigate this, but also you know the matching fund issue. This is something that really resounds with our board um, because they deal with this issue on a day to day basis, trying to leverage federal dollars or even state funds for programs that they're they're presenting and, and trying to fund. And so um, local match is a challenge for the AAA as well. We were talking about that this morning um, in our staff meeting. So um, we want to make for sure that that's in front of the board because local match, you know, they should, <laughs> our elected officials should know that they need to be figuring out from their budget perspective, how do we help support our organizations and our essential services through, through helping fund this local match issue. Um, identify more ways for um, PPACD and PPAAA transit funds to expand services by shifting and matching up specific funds to support rural projects. Um, this is something we started um, in our last RFP process. Some people ended up with the flavor of funding that uh, they may not have applied for, but we looked at, you know, what is the core services that that, that provider is, is um, providing to the community and what's the right flavor of funding with the constraints of each, each funding source really matches the needs of that organization. So we're going to continue to do that. Um, 
advocate for potential more regional transportation. Um, that's something that came out of the Tri-County study, not just from an El Paso County perspective, but people want to be able to go um, amongst the counties, um, even for leaf peeping, individuals with disabilities and seniors want to do things that everybody else wants to do. Um, identify legislative opportunities to break down barriers. Um, I think this is something that um, I'd like to engage you guys more and more. Um, we have revamped our legislative committee with the board and our legislative committee with the board is focused on sort of some more broader things. So if there's any kind of legislation from a state perspective, um, as well as a federal perspective that you guys feel is a barrier for you guys, please share that with us so that we can have that conversation with our legislative committee and our board. I already plugged them for a few things um, that I knew about. Um, provide further outreach and education. That's going back to making for sure people know what um, services are available to them so that they're not in the box of one provider providing services to them, that they understand the full gamut of what's available to them. Um, all right. So that's what I presented to the board. And it's 1044. Um, I want to spend, let me stop share. I want to spend the next 10 minutes or so kind of talking through having an open discussion of, of what are additional barriers for you guys and what kind of resources do you feel like you need moving forward um, to help um, address those barriers? And I don't I understand money. <laughs> You know, money is always one of those barriers because if we have more money, we can do more. But put actual things to that money so that we can better understand from an IT perspective, from a driver perspective, from a vehicle perspective, from any kind of operational need to help address what is coming out of these conversations. I'm open that up to everybody. So like a more cohesive software, you know. Oh, well, you unmuted, but I can't hear you. That's okay. Oh. How about now? Oh, all right, I'm gonna kick this off since we have crickets oh. going on here. Oh. Just so I can so, interview, Paul said so something. We talked earlier about on-demand service. And Gail mentioned some of their constraints um, about providing on-demand services. What are some of the perceived challenges do you think um, your organization um, may have if you were to launch one of these programs? Better Paul software, said better software, more cohesive more. technology. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it says people were talking, but I don't think you were able to hear. Yeah, what's going on? Hmm. What is going yeah. on? Can you hear us now? I can. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Paul was talking and then I was trying to help Paul. <laughs> so, okay, sorry. Um, no one else was talking that I'm aware of, but okay. yeah, he was talking about software, more cohesive okay. software. And I, I, I can probably, even though I'm not necessarily involved specifically in the transit part, I do think that part is intimidating to a lot of people or... Um, how they all talk to each other and, and some people have one software and some people have a different one. So I agree that that's maybe a really good discussion to, to talk about. It's a very big issue. I mean, I see that all the time just data that, you know, uh, the software is outdated and these drivers are running all around town and not, uh, it's just not sensible of what they're, their routes are, you know, doesn't seem like, and they, and I get the same response from them when they 
talk to us about it. You know, uh, I think if it's just more cohesive all around somehow or another or one working better than the other, that's a, that's a big issue right there. I'll mention that it's not, you know, that it's, there's two different um, areas of software. You know, one is the technology, the software that the service providers are using to coordinate rides. But then on the flip side, you know, there are some areas across the country that really work to create apps, um, you know, single point entry systems. And I understand that we have older adults as well as people with disabilities that would have a really hard time accessing, um, you know, some type of an app or software program to schedule their ride. But yet in other parts of the country, when they have that system set up, it becomes a lot more streamlined for people to just go in and schedule their one ride. And that ride gets, you know, set up wherever it needs to get set up. And the person themselves doesn't have to try to figure out, well, am I calling and make scheduling a ride with this entity or that entity? It's just that, you know, single point entry going in. So I think there are two different pieces of technology slash software that could continue to be explored and put into place. And, you know, I think, you know, five years down the road here, you know, that, as older adults are aging into, you know, technology and needs for services that are very different from what they might do today. You know, when we go around on our community conversations, we're talking with some pretty savvy older adults, but literally five years from now, they could be needing to make these calls. And, you know, for them to have just that one point, um, you know, access, will just be so much better for people, um, you know, in a few years from now. I hope folks could hear me talking. Yes. Anybody else from an on-demand perspective? I mean, Laura, it's Kathy Lowry. I mean, one of our challenges is if all of our drivers are booked, and somebody needs a ride at the last minute, you know, we have a challenge in getting that scheduled, though we do schedule a lot of them. So we certainly are exploring the idea of on-call drivers and how will that work. So that might be something we need to think about uh, for the various providers. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Here's one of the things I just kind of want to throw out there. Um, and it's sort of that cliff or, or jumping into the water situation. Um, if, if you were to have sort of two different types of, in which you guys kind of already have, two different types of riders um, or two different types of trips, you have sort of those trips that are um, everyday reoccurring trips. So like Paul has to go to work every day kind of situation. Um, you have folks that have to go to dialysis every day. What would be a world look like to you guys if, if those trips were mapped out in your system, which are kind of already happening, mapped out in this, your system, and all the other trips outside of that were on-demand trips. What would that look like in your world? And what do you think some of the inputs would um, you would need in order for that to happen? I'll start it off. Laura, part of the I think you deal with when you can do an advanced notice is you can basically create higher efficiencies on your routes. Lower efficiency typically would mean more vehicles. So, I mean, in terms of, it depends when those trips are coming in though. If you're on demand or mixed in with your, what you refer to as subscription, in our scenario, that would be a challenge. If you're on demand or occurring during, you know, the, the non-subscription um, or the off-peak hours, because for us, our subscription is primarily the day programs. Um, but if you have, you know, those trips that are on demands occurring during off-peak, non 
day program, that would be easier to do. But with the pandemic, those times have changed to where we've kind of lost our bat ears, if you will. And it's become more of a solid, uh, more consistent amount throughout the day. So really, it's it's the efficiency that's lost from doing on-demand. That, that's a challenge. Okay. And that drives up cost per trip in a general sense, too. Yeah. What kind of system? And I, I will say this, you know, there is a huge push out there for microtransit um, options, which is on-demand options. And there are software systems that help with the navigation and that efficiency piece that you're talking to talking about, Jacob. Um, is that something from this group's perspective? I know Invita has already communicated that they're they're going to um, work on a pilot with us. Is that something that this group would be interested in exploring and maybe us bringing in some of that, some agencies? who have made the switch um, to talk to this group um, so that they can kind of ident kind of speak to, you know, what are some of the things that they had to overcome in order to make some of these changes. But also from a software perspective, you know, have the agencies talk about, you know, what are some of the characteristics of the, the software that helps them with that efficiency um, uh, challenge. So, I know that um, one of the ways that on-demand has worked is just by putting some, um, has worked a little bit better because when we say on-demand, we think, oh, it's anybody and everybody in the whole world and we're, we're going to have everybody calling us and changing or asking for a ride all at the same time. But putting, you know, what defining what on-demand is um, from a provider perspective um, whether that is, you know, we get we are on demand in terms of we can provide that ride within two hours. We need, you know, six hours in advance, 12 hours in advance, knowing that typically our other rides are two weeks in advance. Um, so putting parameters around what is that definition of on demand um, from a regional perspective. Um, also looking at it from the perspective of, you know, this pilot or this or this program only operates within these boundaries, these geographic boundaries. Um, I've also, you know, had organizations that I've been interacting with that have provided a limited number of opportunities for folks to book an on-demand ride. Um, so those are some things that I can bring back to the group in terms of identifying some providers throughout the country um, to help sort of talk through some of these things that they've overcome through IT, but also through the parameters of an on-demand program. So I'll throw this out there for you, Laura. I was um, up at the uh, APTA conference a few uh, we uh, weeks ago, and yep. there was a... Um, tour that I went on that had to do with kind of the very thing you're talking about right now. So in Seattle, they have uh, set up with Sound Transit, which is their light rail, um, where you can take the light rail to these, there's various stations along the way where they're having this issue, okay, you get to the rail station, but how do you get into the community itself? And so they partnered with VIA, um, which is, they've done a study for us in the past, but they partnered with VIA and VIA has their own um, app that they use for it. Um, to where you could get from the train or from the train, and in the, it was within the, you mentioned the geographics uh, specific area, you could take a trip either to or from that rail station to anywhere within a certain boundary of the neighborhood, um, but your trip had to begin or end at the the train station. Um, and I hopped on in the group I was with. I think there were five of us, and we um, I think it, had we paid out of pocket, it was a tour, but had we paid out of pocket, it would have been three bucks a person for a one-way trip in, in the community. And we went about a mile or a mile and a half. Um, and it was, you know, they came, picked us up, took about 15, 20 minutes. Um, we, we surged it because we were a tour, a tour group and there were about six or seven small groups waiting, but I mean, they were coming every five minutes. Um, mm -hmm. And what they did with that, it's a little similar to Uber, but a little 
well, quite a bit different too, is where people will sign up for their shifts. They, I think they said they do it in eight hour blocks um, and VIA provides the vehicle. So you're that accessibility, that's the big concern with partnering with like an Uber or Lyft is will you have accessible vehicles? Yeah. Um, that, that's a huge concern. Um, we have had difficulty with taxi. We only have a couple of accessible taxi vehicles, much less people that are on the Uber or Lyft apps, but they'll, they'll come with a, with a VIA vehicle. And we were talking with one of the drivers and the driver, I felt like he was a plant a little bit just because it was too good to be true. Um, but he was commenting on just how much he actually loved doing it because he was serving his specific communities or people he knew that needed rides places and he was able to help in his uh, in his little community that he was at. But that might be a project worth checking out. Um, and when I was leaving Seattle, the same trip, I saw people waiting for that same bus at the train station that we went to. So it was being used to, at least as far as the limited time I could see it. But um, it was a really cool program. I brought that back here. And I mean, it's this is Seattle, very, very large metro area. You know, we don't have trains here. Um, but, you know, it's so I'm not sure how much transfers over, but there's there's something within just that general operational standard to do that could, I think, be something beneficial in our region. I just don't know what that looks like yet. Yeah, um, and I think that's great to share, Jacob. Um, there's, like you mentioned, it's hard to figure out apples to apples, but we can kind of pull from some of these opportunities that we've sort of seen um, have occurred well in, in throughout the com- country. And I think that's what I want to get at, Jacob, is you know, what are some of these big picture ideas that we can kind of think through in the next several months, especially as we kind of enter the specialized transit plan and also the transit plan with you guys? Um, and so I, I think that these are some things that we can, we can, big picture ideas that we can kind of put out there. Gail, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. So, you know, he has looked at uh, last, I'd say almost nine months, you know, the different softwares that are available for, um, on demand and the more demand response and, and do they coexist and can they coexist? So even like a year and a half ago, route maps said almost they're really two different systems. When we looked at the other market leaders, um, it was TripSpark um, and Eco Lane and um, uh, Via software out of New York and Long Island. And so they really were uh, looking at two different kinds of software. And I'm not sure if Jacob, you saw that when you were uh, at, at APTA, but that's what I've been seeing when we talk to them directly. I've been working with Via Mobility up in Boulder about their RFP and how they're looking at um, upgrading their software to support the community better. So, I mean, Invita, because of the coach acquisition, has had this you know, very intimate view of what it looks like to have on-demand and demand response and how we can work together around that. But currently, um, they are not, uh, they are two different kinds of systems that what I see in the software. And I do hesitate when we use, you know, the acronym API, they are always a band-aid. And so they break when the software upgrades. And so they are not, um, you know, panacea to these problems. It's really more this integration of the software. And it is a fairly sophisticated um, background. So it does require people with some IT skills and business analyst skills you know, stuff that, you know, that we would, I think it would behoove us to look at getting um, some grants to support um, bringing in IT kind of people to help us understand what that looks like. I mean, I have a bit of an IT background, but I'm, you know, I'm a dinosaur in that. It was 20, 30 years ago. So I think um, how we look at it now um, and and what we, you know, and, and Jacob, to speak your point, Seattle is much different than the Colorado Springs environment, the density, the, um, the kinds of transit available to them, um, the depth of their bus service and the light rail. And, you know, they have a lot of Ubers on this there. Um, that's not quite true in our geographic footprint. So what does that look like for us? Um, uh, but that is a week. We've, we've thought about this, you know, even before we acquired Coach, now we're living it that we've acquired Coach. You know, I'm not quite sure where Invita will land. I'd like to invite others to join us as we look at um, going after these grants um, to, to participate um, in our own kind of pilot of um, integrating other providers with us, um, as we did with Fountain Valley and Silver Key, where we could push rides to each other. I think the software now is able, uh, the ones that we were looking at, the market leaders, where you can segment 
um, fleets or in business back maybe providers so that you know the trips are uh, can be delivered by whoever that partner or that provider is but it all could be in one cohesive uh, software system and then it would ease the back office on all of the transportation providers in that you know there are a lot of requirements around entity reporting around drug and alcohol around all those things so we're looking for people who'd like to contact and work with Avita on that level as we look at some of these pilots so time okay uh, we've got to set the meeting for tonight. Yes. So Melissa's reminding me of time. Um, this is a discussion I want us to pick back up on in December. Um, Cause, and, you know, I think if we could sort of from the next couple of meetings perspective, look at this from a workshop uh, idea of pulling out some of these needs that um, have come out of the assessment and us sort of have this general conversation like we're having today. And I really appreciate people um, uh, contributing to the conversation. But for us to kind of um, talk through these things so that uh, we can understand as PPACG what kind of supports we need to give to you guys as a group, but how are um, how is the group supporting each other? So I appreciate um, what we talked about today. Um, just a, a, a closing of that, um, I am working with Invita to kind of think through this on-demand pilot um, and implementation of an on-demand pilot that's going to be really small, um, but small and mighty, but um, something that we hope we can demonstrate um, to roll out more broadly. Uh, and want to roll out more broadly with our, our other uh, service providers too in the future. Um, so um, I'll, we'll be able to talk a little bit more probably next meeting um, about that work plan um, and sort of the, the timeline of rolling out that pilot um, and sort of the nuances and, and, as I mentioned before, boundaries around the program um, that we're putting together. So thanks again. And Kristen, I'm kicking it to you. All right. Thanks, Laura. That was great. And thank you all for the discussions. And we look forward to uh, keep diving into that. Um, so just right before we, we adjourn, um, we were going to talk about the next couple meetings. Um, typically, we don't meet in November because of Thanksgiving. Um, and then we also typically meet um, the first Tuesday in December and do driver appreciation. So do we need to vote on that, Melissa, or just letting folks know? I think, you know, with folks that are on the call today, if they could just take a quick look at their calendars and oh, see okay. if your first Tuesday is open from 9.30 to 10.30 slash 11. Um, and then, you know, a heads up, I will be sending reminders out about driver appreciation. And while I have Jared, he joined us back in the room. Um, you know, we've tried before, but we might have success this year if we did a press release announcing stuff about the drivers. And, um, you know, last year we thought we would actually try to do it in person and then potentially have the press come and do, you know, an in-person um, news thing with all these different drivers, but that's too hard. It sounds really great, but it's just too hard because the drivers are busy driving. But we might get, um, you know, a story printed somewhere. Um, and Jared and I can talk about that a little bit more in terms of how to stage that a little bit better. But just a heads up, everybody that, um, you know, I'll be sending out kind of a little outline for the driver appreciation. And so as I've said that, I'll circle back. Did people look at their calendars? Are they open on that first Tuesday of December? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I am. Um, so it's December 6th. So I don't know who I am. Too. I'm available. Okay. Paul. I'm good. Jacob. Okay. Miss Diana. I'm good. All right. Okay. Party. So sounding, sounding so pretty Let's do okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we know we can't, they can't all make it, but I think last year, unless I'm blurring my years together, I thought we at least had three or four drivers in person last year with a certificate and did a photo, at least a photo and stuff like that, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll shoot for that again. 
Um, and then, yeah, in January, we will do the official voting of officers. We are talking behind the scenes on bylaw discussion, kind of like what we've talked about, blowing it up a bit and having it more committee-like um, or like, sorry, task force-like, um, um, just kind of blowing up the MCC a little bit. So we'll be talking more about that. Anything that I missed? Otherwise, okay. Well, thank you all. What a great meeting. We covered a lot of stuff and we're going to adjourn at 11.08. And yeah, happy Halloween. <laughs> Hope you guys hang in there and we'll see you in December. And then look, be checking your emails for stuff from Melissa. Thank you for helping us with that. So, all right. Take care, everyone.